love what the Lord is doing. And uh, you know, we're at that time of year, right? We're at that time of year. I just realized the other day, going down the street, how many know you're at that time of year right now that what you think looks like a pile of trash in people's yard is actually Halloween decorations? How many of Okay, you ever see that? Yeah, well, we're kind of at that time of the year. It's just that, no, it's actually a beautiful time of the year. And uh, getting excited and ready for uh, next week for our uh, Harvest Festival there at the OC. And um, if you like information about that, you just contact the office or someone here today. And, uh, or just show up next Saturday at uh, 1536 Catherine Street. So we're excited about that. Also today, we are um, doing the Life Chain, which is uh, a one-hour really prayer meeting, uh, kind of a silent prayer meeting, and uh, have a wonderful time. But you know... It doesn't matter really who you are, what kind of Christian you are, or who you voted for in the last election. I believe that every Christian needs to celebrate life and stand for the right of the unborn. Amen. Come on. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. It's not a political thing today. It's not, uh, you know, even though we could stand on social justice on this one, but how many know this is on righteousness? Amen. Today. The Bible says that God's throne is settled and established on the foundation of righteousness and justice. And our God is just. Come on, our God is righteous. Our God is. And so those are the things I just want to encourage you to, about today. And uh, we're not, you know, making uh, faces at people and raising our fists and, and all that. You can do that on Monday, right? And uh, you can do that somewhere else on Monday. But today we're just going to be praying and uh, standing together as believers and uh, praying uh, for this great need. And so uh, one of the things I've realized is that uh, recently that the world isn't becoming more atheistic. Did you know that? We don't, we're not getting more atheists in the world, but the world is becoming more spiritually hungry. Amen. And I believe the church needs to kind of get up and arise right now and stand on this and say, Lord, amen, it's not that we need to fight with people and make them believe in God. We need to see your power. Amen. Because people are spiritually hungry today. There's more people chasing after spiritual things and than ever before. It might not be God. Come on, it's not the Lord, but amen. And I believe that it's time for the power of God to be seen through His church. Amen. Like He intended. Amen. And so I want to encourage you to just continue to be a witness and continue to, you know, have a heart for those that are lost and those that don't know the Lord. And Lord, just reveal your power. How many are thankful for someone in your life that prayed for you and somebody prayed that prayer over you, said, Lord, amen. Come on, bring some Bible-thumping Christian by them their way. Amen. Come on. And uh, some of you feel trapped. I know God trapped me. Amen. But it was good. It was all good. It was a love trap. It was all great. You know. Amen. But uh, I want to just encourage as well, um, this next week we're going to be doing uh, prayer walks at the OC meeting every night there at 6 o'clock and just doing prayer walks over the neighborhood and uh, not necessarily uh, witnessing or, or praying for people, even though if the opportunity rises, we will do that. But I just wanted to say, if you're coming Monday and Tuesday, those are the kind of more important nights because we're passing out 500 flyers about the uh, Harvest Festival. So if you come Monday or Tuesday, we really need you to kind of hand out some flyers as well and, and just put them on people's uh, doors and, and uh, things like that. So uh, that's very important. One of the things I wanted to just do before we get into the Word today and uh, um, I want to just show you kind of a map of uh, the east end of Williamsport. And so one of the things you can just get a vision for is that we're going to be covering this whole area in prayer uh, Monday through Friday this, this week. And uh, I believe there's like 1,200 to 1,500 houses in this area. And, uh, and just, this is just from really Penn Street over to beyond Catherine Street. Um, and so if you look in the top right-hand corner, you'll squint your eyes a little bit. You can see the Outreach Center. And, uh, but how many believe God wants to, uh, us to kind of take this region for Jesus and, and really spread the gospel in East End? That's why the Lord has us there. And so just wanted to give you a picture of like, you know, how kind of the Lord looks down. But anyways, I don't know, that's Google Earth. But, and, uh, you, know, and just, you know, just that vision. And so we have um, kind of broke this area up into five different areas that we feel like we're going to be doing prayer walks over. Uh, if you would ever just like to do prayer walks, we'd invite you to do that. But uh, if you would walk this whole um, the c circumference of this whole area right here, it's just around four and a half miles. So everyone that likes a good hike and a good walk, there it is. And so you can uh, take that. And so, amen. And this is an area that we're just believing God that we're going to pray over for, first of all, we're going to pray over for salvation. Amen. We're going to pray over people that know the Lord, and we're going to pray over churches in this area and all the Christians that are in the area, and uh, just that we could work together and we could love one another, and that we'll just flow in every person in this area. Our goal is in the next couple of years that every person will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's kind of our vision. And part of our vision here at the church is to reach. So we love God and, and, uh, 
You know, we grow in our faith and then we reach our world. And so we believe that God really calls us to reach our world. And uh, I think it's so easy to put money in the offering for, uh, you know, a missionary overseas and, and world hunger and, and everything like that. But how many know there's so many needs right here? Right here. Amen. And right across the street from you, right across the road. And, and uh, we're believing God for every country road, every alley, every street, amen, that the gospel will just be able to, through his people, God will just use his people to, to just give people an opportunity to hear, right, to hear the gospel, but also feel the love of Jesus, amen. And I don't know about you, but um, we're not going to have anybody come from another country and do this work. This is all really up to us. And so um, we just want to encourage you today that... Um, We've got a big a task ahead of us, amen, but it, it does better, we go, we go, it'll go well, it'll go better if we work together, amen? So we believe that God wants to use our church and, and, and the churches in the city to reach our city, and our region, our, our county for Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you about something today, amen, I want to talk to you about citywide revival, citywide revival. Now, I may not be able to give you all the, uh, all the everything that we can do, but I just want to just kind of point out some things in Scripture that really talk about how that the Lord's will and desire is that through the gospel and the kingdom of God being in believers that we can impact our city. And that it's very important to understand that God's intention for us is not to come to church, sit like a bump on the dill pickle, but to impact those around you. Come on, God raised you up in this generation for this time, for right now to preach his gospel. Come on, right? Anybody? No, that's for the evangelist. Oh, that's for the pastor. That, no, that's for every believer in Jesus Christ. You are marked by this call. You are mandated by the Holy Ghost, amen, to preach the gospel. And so people are like, well, you know, I wanted to hear about the prophetic utterance of the third nations and all this stuff. Well, you'll have to go or come some other time. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that some other time. Maybe. We'll see. But in Luke chapter 24, I just wanted to encourage you today about citywide revival and how the Lord wants to move in our city in revival, amen, and move the move of God. And so I um, really want to just read just one verse, and then we'll talk. In Luke chapter 24, verse um, 47, this is actually at the end. We see Jesus taking the communion like we did this morning. And one of the things that he um, really talked about, this is part of the Great Commission, he said that this, that, um, that really it, it behooved Christ to suffer. Now, th at this point, he's actually... Uh, going back to the scriptures and showing the disciples that it was necessary for Jesus to suffer, it was ne necessary for him to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day, that repentance, in verse 47, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, that's all people groups, be, be, uh, beginning at Jerusalem. How many believe it starts at home, it starts right here? We could put this in, be beginning at Jerusalem. In, in Williamsport, amen. And then you turn over in Acts chapter 1 and verse 7. They were talking about when is the kingdom of God going to come? And when, are, basically, Jesus, when are you going to come back? When is the kingdom of God going to be set up in the earth? And, and uh, when is all that going to be fulfilled? Jesus said this. He said, that's not given in your power. That's not, that kind of power, that kind of knowledge is not given to you. You're not going to, you won't know that. Only that's given to the Father. How many know that? That's that the date and the time and all that, that's, that's only given to the Father, Jesus said. Amen. But he said, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to give you power. I am going to give you power. Come on, dunamis, dunamis power. I am going to give you miraculous power. I am going to anoint you. Amen. That is to be my witnesses in the earth. So how many know we're not anointed to know the end times, all the details and specifics and every little uh, detail, but we are anointed to be his witnesses. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? Amen? Come on, if you were anointed to don't know the end times, every one of us had a, a bestseller book on the end times, right? But you're not anointed to do that. You're anointed to be his witnesses, amen, in the earth. And so I believe it's not about having the greatest church in our city, but it's about having the power of God that is greater than the darkness in our city, come on, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I believe that God wants to do some amazing things if the people of God realize that God wants citywide Revival. Amen. And so we see Jesus' ministry and we see the life of Jesus. I need to go through this quickly because we are going to look at some scriptures today. In Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says at the beginning of Jesus' ministry that he went about all of Galilee. The Bible says he went teaching in their synagogues, in verse 23, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people, whoever 
had need. And his fame, the Bible says, went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those that were possessed with devils and, and, and those that have had troubles and problems, the Bible says, and sicknesses and those who had palsy. The Bible says he healed them all. I love that. Amen. And there verse 25. And there followed him a great multitude of people from Galilee and Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. This is a huge region that he's talking about. So these are people that follow Jesus, so that'd be like, uh, you know, Jesus being here and doing some amazing things in Williamsport, and the next thing you know, there's people from Jersey following Jesus. There's people from beyond Harrisburg, way down below Harrisburg and State College and out in the western Pennsylvania, they're following Jesus. I mean, they're packing their bags, getting their cars packed, and coming to Williamsport to follow Jesus. Think about it. That's what it's like. That's how big that region was. That's how much his fame went about. That's how popular Jesus was. But how many know the power of the gospel is about promoting Jesus? Amen? And so Jesus was, what we see it was so, so uh, amazing that was happening, but this was the effect of the gospel. This was not just him promoting, hey, be a celebrity ministry. This is how you do it. No, he was promoting the gospel of the kingdom. And through the gospel, amen, the whole region was touched. Think about it. Wow, that's, that's a big area, isn't it? Sometimes we think Jesus had a small following and, and everything. But as we'll see in scripture, the Bible makes it clear that he couldn't even go into certain cities because it was so packed. So jam-packed that people were wanting to hear from him and wanting to be around him. The Bible says in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, that the Bible says that there were so many people that came to hear his word that, that, that the whole city was gathered together literally at the door of that house. I mean, it was so packed that people were just jammed into this neighborhood. They couldn't even get in, the Bible says, right? And so the Bible even says in verse 45 that, he, couldn't, he had to go out in the countryside because the cities were too packed full of people that wanted to hear the gospel. I mean, no, that's city revival. Amen. I mean, come on. When people want to, you know, hear the word of God, whether they come to church or a life group or a coffee shop or wherever it is, because they want to hear the gospel, because they want to hear from God. Wow, that's, that's citywide revival. Amen. I love that. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David, and the Bible says multitudes were singing and rejoicing. And then in verse 10 it says, And when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who in the world is this? Amen. How many want to see all of Williamsport moved? Amen. How many want to see this whole county asking the question, Who in the world is Jesus? Amen. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to see, right? And so we have to understand that the power of the gospel impacts entire cities but only through people who understand God's intentions. I mean, that's really what happens. And that's how citywide revival happens. It's not just like, well, it's just some mystical cloud that overnight comes in and, and just kind of fills homes and everybody gets saved, you know. And, and that, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Just wake up and everybody's saved and have to do anything? That's awesome. But how many know it just kind of doesn't work that way? God wants to move, use you. God wants to use, amen, move through, th through you and use his power to move through you and his word to move through you. Why? That people will be saved. How many believe that, right? Amen. In John chapter 12, verse 19, the Pharisees complained about Jesus in private. And this was their topic of discussion around the water cooler at the pharisaical office there, at their headquarters, right? I'm just making that up. And so he's, he said this. He said, we have lost this thing. He said, the whole world is going after Jesus, and we can't do a thing about it. That's good frustration, isn't it? Come on, when, when people that hate Jesus were so frustrated because he was more popular than them. Man, the people were coming you know, to Jesus and, and hearing the gospel and flooding in towns and cities. And I love this about the Lord. He was healing everybody. Love that about the Lord. And then we see the disciples in their ministry. I need to move through this quickly, but the disciples in their ministry, the Bible says in Acts uh, 8, chapter 5 and verse 8, that Philip went down to the city of Samaria, which originally about a month before that or two months before that was forbidden. But because of what Jesus had done on Calvary, the whole world was open to the gospel. Amen. And so they were commanded to go to the city of Samaria. And he preached Christ unto the whole city. And the Bible says there was great joy 
in that city. Samaria was big, by the way. It was huge, by the way. And then later on, you'll see that Philip had uh, ministered to an Ethiopian, and he was actually the treasurer of all Ethiopia. And I believe that because of his, his conversion, amen, it opened the door to all of Africa to hear the gospel. Amen. There was great joy in that city. Tremendous things happening at that time, especially in the book of Acts. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, 14, verse 21, he said that then, then the disciples had gone down and they preached the gospel to that city. It wasn't just like, hey, we're going to go and we're going to go into this, guy's, this Christian guy's house. We're going to have some coffee. We're going to talk about the things of God. We're going to shake a little bit. We're going to get excited. And then we're going to go on to the next town. No, they preached the gospel to the whole city. They didn't just hit the good parts. Hello. You don't just hit the good parts with the gospel. You don't just hit, amen, the people that have got money and live up on the hill and they come on and they're well. You, you hit the whole city, amen. And they, they just preached the gospel to the whole city. They just saw a vision for the whole city. And the Bible says there was a great revival in that area because of that, amen. And Acts chapter 13, and it says this in verse 44 and, and verse 48 and 49. It says that the word of God, the word of the Lord was published because of the disciples preaching and throughout the whole region, again, this is like over 100 miles, or almost 100 miles, amen, was impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen, I love it. There was citywide revival going on, amen, right? How many know that's what I want for our city, that's what I want for Williamsport, that's what I want for our county, amen, that it's not just like, okay, yeah, everybody's just following this one ministry, no, people are getting saved. How many have seen some great miracles in your day? How many have seen some great miracles in your day? Yeah, you have. Amen. Come on. I've, I've seen, uh, you know, lame people walk. I've seen some amazing things. But, you know, how many have ever experienced the greatest miracle that ever will be, and that is when somebody gets saved? How many have seen that? Amen. How many know that's exciting? Amen. That's amazing. When someone gets baptized, I mean, I mean that's, that's like the greatest thing. I love that. I mean, I, I, I cried about every baptismal because it's just like, that is so awesome. Amen. God convert someone from the power of darkness into the marvelous kingdom of light. Amen. What a miracle that Jesus does. Amen. Amen. And that's what we want to see in our city. And so in Acts chapter 17, um, again, the Bible records that the leaders of the city were talking and they were complaining and they were scared. They said, they said that the people, that these disciples that have turned the world upside down, they're coming to our city now. So you know what we should do? We should just... Give him everything. We should just open the city to him. We shouldn't give him a, a, hard, a, a hard problem or, or a problem or a, a hard time about what they want to use. We should just, because, I mean, everybody everybody's just loves this and we, we can't stop it. Amen. And I love that about this movement in the book of Acts. Amen. And so one of the things I just wanted to share with you about citywide revival and how the Lord wants to move is that God has always had a plan of impact for His people. God has always uh, had in His power a plan for impact for His people in the earth. Amen. Come on. How many believe that? Amen. And so I want to just show you something that ever since the Old Testament, when you look back in the Old Testament, you'll see that a lot of it was about possessing the land that God had promised Abraham. How many believe that, amen, that a lot of it was about that? How many God spoke to Abraham and he, he said that, I'm going to give you this land. And he laid out the, the, the borders of that land that he would give given them. And how many know they're still fighting over those borders, right? And so he gave them. They said, look. And then he said, I'm going to give it to your son Isaac and Jacob. And then he's going to give it to Joseph. And Joseph's going to restore Israel back to a place of, uh, of restoration so you can inherit this land and you can possess this land. And then, then we see Moses who was called by God after 400 years of sl slavery. They'd called He's the called the deliverer to bring the people. Where? Uh, we're going to have a campfire in the desert somewhere. No, we're going to take you to the promised land. What was the promised land? Well, no, it was the land that God had promised Abraham. God had always said that. That's why it called the promised land, right? We thought it was because it was cool and had water parks and stuff in it. No, it was because that God had promised it to Abraham. I mean, no, God keeps his covenant. And so we see that there was this promise, and then David even had to fight, and, and they kept struggling to possess this land and maintain this promise that God promised Abraham. Amen. And we see this possessing of the land. And then we see, amen, this promise that God is going to fill his glory. Amen. And the earth is going to be filled with the glory of God. Amen. How many know that's a good promise in the Old Testament? Amen. And then we see that there's these principles of the kingdom and the earth. Amen. That God is establishing. He sent his law. Amen. His precepts. Amen. In the earth. That the earth would know. Amen. God through his precepts. Come on. 
Amen? Isn't that what the Lord did in the Old Testament? We see that happening in the Old Testament. And we talk about possessing the land and taking the cities. Well, what was that all about? And now that we move into the new covenant, what is it really about? What does God have for us? How is this impact that God has for his people today? I mean, I mean, should we go over to Jerusalem and, and find a building that looks kind of like what we would think that in Jericho and march around it seven times until the walls fall down? I mean, what does this look like today? Right? What does this look like today? And I believe that God wants to, to have the same impact in the earth today. But let me just say this about the Old Testament, because sometimes we see these stories in the Old Testament about possessing the land and taking the land and taking the cities, and we kind of misinterpret it, and we kind of blend some things together in our culture and try to make some things work and fit, and it doesn't work out sometimes. But how many know, both in the Old Testament and under the New Covenant, amen, it wasn't about Christians dominating the world and taking control over the seven influences of society. Come on. It was about this. It was about the entire scope was about the Messiah coming. Come on, and people knowing the Lord through fellowship with Him. Did you know that's what the Old Testament was about? Amen? The possess what was the possessing the land about? What was the land all about? You know what it was? People, God needed a people, amen, that He can move through, that He could send His Son through. Amen? He needed somebody to have a land to possess that land because at one time He needed somebody... Amen, to have a little stable or whatever, we, we, it's not a stable, but you know the picture we have at Christmas. Because he wanted, amen, a, 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 a virgin to conceive the Son of God. Come on. Amen, to bring forth, I should say, the Son of God. Amen. And so that was his plan. His plan about the land wasn't that, that they could, you know, uh, be the dominating force in the world. They certainly weren't. <laughs> I said they certainly weren't. So it wasn't about them being the dominating people of the world. It was that the promise of the Messiah of salvation could come through their little nation. Amen? And how many know now that we're under the new covenant, right? Guess what, guess what we're waiting on? We're waiting for the Messiah to come back. <laughs> we're waiting for the Savior to come back. Amen? So guess what? Just like in the Old Testament, they were working on getting a people ready to meet the Lord. And so guess what we're doing in the new, under the new covenant? We're getting people ready to meet Jesus. Amen? Come on, this is all about, amen, the Savior coming back. The Savior coming. Amen? Hallelujah. And so in the Old Testament, they look forward to the new covenant. We look back. Amen? But it's all about getting a people ready to meet Jesus Christ and be in fellowship with Him forever. Amen? Amen? And you know something, if you want to look at the possessing the land, you want to just put these two together. You know, back in the day, and back in the Old Testament, it was about possessing. What does that word mean? Well, we're going to possess the land, and we talked about it and everything. Basically, it was that uh, through the children of Israel, they were going to possess what rightfully belonged to them through their father Abraham. So when it says possess, it means that you're going to seize, you're going to take it over. You know, there's giants in the land, you're going to conquer them, you're going to take back what God gave you. How many remember those songs, right? We're going to take back everything God promised for us and everything. Well, guess, guess, I mean, think about this. What is the possession in the new covenant? What is that possession of God in the new covenant that we're supposed to take and get back? What is it? It's people. I said it's people. Amen? Come on, how many know God created people? The Bible says all souls are His. Amen. He, he, he's created people. Amen. And His possession, amen, in the Garden of Eden became lost. His possession of people fell. Come on, somebody. Amen. Humanity fell and we became lost. That's why Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. That's my possession. That's my inheritance. Amen. How many know Jesus' inheritance was people? He didn't have a house. He didn't have closed much. I mean, and when, when he died, he had nothing, right? So guess what his inheritance was from his father? People. Amen. So we're called to call people back to his possession. Amen. God owns you. God loves you. God wants to have a relationship with you. You need to come back into relationship. You need to come back into restoration. Amen. Into the, what God had planned for you. So that's really our goal as new believers, New Testament believers, that we're trying to get people, amen, that, that possession that God had, we need to preach the gospel so they'll get back to a place of humanity, will come back to a place of salvation or wholeness in the Lord. Come on, somebody, amen. Because that's, that's the Lord's intention. And so that was God's possession. Think about it. People were His possession. And so our, our, our goal is to say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to take back what was lost. <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And so really the impact 
and the power or the influence, the impact, when we talk about that, the power and influence of the kingdom, it really, in the earth, it comes through people that are preaching and practicing the gospel of the kingdom. And so that's what's so important about it. So let me just move on here and just talk about the strategy for impact. I don't think we can really talk about anything about how we can impact our city or citywide revival without talking about prayer and intercession. I mean, that's kind of where it starts, isn't it? Amen? Come on, that's where it starts. And so, uh, you know, the Bible makes it clear even in the Old Testament that we were to ask of the Lord and He would give us the heathen for our possession, the uttermost parts of the world for our inheritance. Come on, ask of me. That's prayer. Ask of me. Right? Come on, we, you've heard these scriptures. You guys are familiar with these scriptures. And so, um, you know, the Bible says in Isaiah that uh, it, it, about the fast that we talked about a couple weeks ago. This is the fast that I've chosen to, to, to set the oppressed free, that they can be, come to a place of wholeness and salvation in the Lord. How do you do that? You do that through the gospel. Amen? You do that through the gospel. And so we also see, amen, of course, that famous scripture when we talk about prayer. If my people were to call by name, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith. Guess what? Then I'm going to heal their land. I'm going to do a work in their city. I'm going to do a work in their land. Amen. How many know prayer opens the door for God to move? Prayer is the thing that will open the door, amen, for, for God, amen, to soften people's hearts. Amen. For, for God to work. Aren't you glad when God does a miracle, God does something on somebody, you don't have to do it hardly. And you just say, you know what? I'm just here to watch. This is great. God's doing it. How many of them, right? And how many know God, God wants to move in this city, but he needs kind of like people that will really welcome him and, and really kind of be uh, uh, interested in the Lord doing it. Amen? And that comes through prayer. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And you know, weeping is a form of intercession. Did you know that? Weeping is a form of intercession. And Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He cried over that city. He, he looked over that city that was called the city of David, the great king, the city of the great king. And he said, man, I wanted to do amazing things, but you rejected me. How many know he wept over the condition of his city? He didn't just say, ah, there's a bunch of bums and they're, you know, we just need to get rid of this and I'll just wipe out these people and start anew. He wept over them. He, he, he still had a plan for them to be saved. He said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send the comforter and I'm going to give you power to the disciples and you're going to do something about this. Amen. Amen. And I believe that we need to have that heart of intercession over our city and our county. And I believe that we need to have that prayer. Jesus said, let this prayer that we have this formula of prayer, if you will, that your will be done in earth, in our city, as it is in heaven. That's what we want. We, how many know it's God's will to save people? It's God's will to heal people. It's God's will to deliver people. That's certainly God's will. Let's start right there, and let's start with prayer, right? Amen? And so one of the things I just want to encourage you as I'm moving along, three things happen when we pray for our city, right? Number one, it brings a compassion for people. When you start walking the streets of Williamsport or just walking the streets of your neighborhood or just getting out and talking to people and you start praying for those people, how many know you start developing a compassion for them? Right. Right. Amen. You may not get along. <laughs> you may not get along, you, you know, but you, 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 you have a pe compassion for them. You know, before when you would pass those people on the street or in your neighborhood, you'd be like, man, that, oh man, they're dirty, they're stinky, they're smelly. I don't want to be around those type of people. Thank God. You know, come on. We, but when you pray for people, it brings a compassion for people. Is that right? Yeah. Amen. It brings a compassion for people. Jesus saw the multitudes and the Bible says he had compassion and he healed them. Amen. Compassion opens the door for healing. Hello. Amen. For ministry. You, wanna, you want the ministry? You want to be in the ministry? Develop compassion for people. Amen? All right, let's move along. So Acts chapter 17, the Bible says that while Paul waited for his fellow uh, ministers at Athens, he had to stop there. Some things came up and he said, I'll just spend the night here in Greece and I'll just stop and I'll wait for my team and then we'll go on and we'll keep going on a missionary journey. The Bible says his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the whole city was given over to idolatry. Something happened in him like, wow, these people are lost. These people have lost. Have ever, anybody seen videos of last year what's happening in the streets of Philadelphia? I mean, this is in Kensington Avenue. This is, this is crazy. Like, they call them the zombies, right? And, and you got it in San Francisco and San Diego and Portland and all these city, major cities. The people are just out of their minds on the streets. And your heart should break for that, that stuff. Your heart shouldn't just say, you know what? Those people are lost. They deserve it. Yeah, and a city needs to put them away. Listen, something needs to happen in your heart. Said, man, Lord, they are so lost. What can I do? Hello, what can I do? 
Amen. I believe we can start with prayer. Amen. Praying brings compassion for people. Prayer enlarges your vision for the gospel. It enlarges your vision. You begin to see what the Bible's about and what the gospel is about. It's not just get in church. It's God so loved the world. Amen. So it enlarges your vision. Jesus said, lift up your eyes. Look up. Lift, look, lift up your vision and see that the harvest is right now. Amen. And thirdly, it gives you, God gives you a strategy to witness. God gives you a plan and a strategy. And, and so, you know what? The, I can mow their lawn. I can reach out that way. I can, I can buy them some diapers or whatever. I can give them a gift card. I can, I can help them with uh, painting. I can do some things. I can serve. Come on, somebody. I can give them rides. I can help them, at, you know, maybe go to the hospital and see how they're doing. I can visit those that are, uh, you know, uh, and critically ill at the hospital. I mean, there's something I can do. How many know God gives you strategy for witnessing? I like to think of it this way. When Peter was fishing, how many know when you cast a net, that's a picture of fishing, right? And so when Peter were there fishing all night, the Bible says, we didn't catch anything. And witnessing feels like that, by the way. He said, we didn't catch anything. We didn't do anything. What did Jesus say? He gave him some God-sized strategy, didn't he? He said, go out again and cast your net on the right side, and you're going to catch a lot of fish. And so God will speak to you as you're in prayer. Amen. How many know God God's, has a hard time speaking to people whose Bible's closed, whose ears are closed, who are too busy? Amen. But God will speak to you, and prayer has a way of getting you in position for God to speak to you. Come on, somebody. Amen. So I encourage you to pray. Amen. And so then we also know that there's great power in prayer. In every realm, in the supernatural and the natural realm, there's great power in prayer. I want to just show you something real quick. That Jesus sent 70 of his disciples to cities that he planned on attending. Did you notice that? He laid hands on them. He gave them some instructions. Right? Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. And the Bible says that he sent them to cities that he planned on uh, visiting eventually. Isn't that neat? That's what prayer does. Prayer goes before the word ever comes. Prayer can go before the gospel ever comes. Come on, somebody. Amen. Prayer can go there before God gets there. Amen, sometimes. And, and so that's what happens in prayer. And I love to see that um, picture. Let me just quickly move a, along here. That The second thing is not just prayer and intercession, but preaching and witnessing. We know that's very important. And how in the world can someone get saved, Romans chapter 10, unless somebody is preaching? It's just not going to happen. And so, uh, but let me just say this, that it's about prayer and actions working together. It's about prayer and actions working together. I mean, you know, Jesus said that we've got to pray. We really do. But then we've got to go, right? And so we, we pray. And Psalms 126 and verse 6, I don't have time to talk about this. But the Bible says that when we came, they came back from captivity, uh, you know, the fields were barren. And uh, they were just depressed over what they saw. But he gave them a key in, uh, in faith. He gave them a, a we call it a faith key. And he said, he said, go out to the fields. And he said, he that goes forth and weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, rejoicing, bringing his harvest with him. That's a tremendous principle when it comes to winning the lost. Because, you know, we look out in the world and we see desolation. We see, and it depresses us. Come on. But how many know that we don't just take a little seed and plant it in the ground? The Bible makes it clear here. He's talking about handfuls of seeds. So he said, as you go out, and, you're, and, and this word weeping represents intercession and prayer. As you're going out praying, he said, take handfuls of seed, right? And he said, because there will be a harvest of that seed eventually, and joy is going to come with the harvest. Amen. Jesus said this, and when he was teaching, he said that great joy awaits those who are harvesting souls for the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So... I want to just encourage you as I move along. And so there's a couple of things that happen as they preach the gospel in the book of Acts. Number one, the word of God increased, the Bible said. The word of God increased. The Bible, the knowledge of the Bible, the things of the Lord increased. Uh, in one place it says that the word of God grew and it multiplied. Or another place said it grew and it prevailed. Right? And then the second thing happened that was so cool. It said the number of disciples grew. That's multiplication. Amen. The Bible says that daily was added to the church. And so uh, there was this multiplication. There was this number of disciples growing in the earth as they were preaching the gospel. And I've heard people preach that, you know, we really just need to really move in a lot of uh, today. It's, it's, you know, um, 
that it's not about the gospel. It's not about uh, telling people about getting saved and things like that necessarily. Well, you know, we need to see some social justice and humanitarian work. And, and we need to see, uh, uh, you know, kind of positive influence. And we've got to be that. Listen, all that happens after the gospel is preached. Amen? All that happens after the gospel is preached. Amen. And so we got to understand that, yeah, that can happen. Yes, that should happen. Yes, that will happen as we focus on the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is the only thing that's really going to heal our land. It's the only thing that's really going to deliver people, right? Come on. I mean, it, you can feel better about yourself. You can, you can, you know, do some things in our world. We can help people, make them feel better about themselves. But how many know they're still in their condition? The gospel changes people's eternal condition. Amen. And that's what we should be about. That's what we should be our heart about. And, and that's what it's about. And so I'm going to skip through this real quick and just quickly end by giving you the effects of preaching, the impact of preaching, or whatever you want to call it, the effects of preaching. And as we preach the gospel, as we really have a heart to see this citywide revival, some things happen. Number one, it produces faith to be saved. And as you talk to people about the Lord and you talk to them about the Bible, not everybody, but it really has that potential to produce faith to be saved, Romans chapter 10. Number two, there's a ripple effect. How many know the moving of God's Spirit always brings a ripple effect? People are always affected by what God does. Amen. How many know when God does something, He doesn't just do it with one person? Amen. Even if He did it one person, there's many other people that can be affected by just what one, one person, uh, what God does in one person. Come on, somebody, right? I mean, you know, what God did and how God showed himself to Moses on that mountain, over 7 million people were affected, impacted by what God did through Moses. Amen. Come on, I can give you examples, but I mean, look at the life of Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Look, look at the moving of the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts. I mean, look at all these things. So there's this rippling effect. He gives it here in Acts chapter eight, uh, 1, verse 8. Start in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's how the rippling effect happen in your family, locally, nationally, globally, in your family, in your home. Uh, how many know the gospel's got to hit your home, right? It's got to be in your home and in your neighborhood and on your street and, and then maybe in, the, in that region, that kind of like that block or whatever, and then in your city. And, and that's the way the gospel was intended, that it would grow through people, one person telling another person. Amen? And so it has a ripple effect. The other thing is, is that it really uh, is important that when the effects of preaching are, is that you begin to find key people in the city. All of a sudden, when you begin to preach, you'll find, like in Mark chapter 5, Jesus met a man who was possessed with a legion of demons, right? And, and so the Bible says that everybody knew this guy and were scared to death of him. Everybody knew. That, that's, that's crazy Larry out there. That's crazy Larry. He, he's, na he's naked. Hide your kids. Hide your kids. Halloween, we're not hanging out. I mean, he's, he's, he's crazy. I mean, this guy, he's all over the place. He's demons possessed, man. I don't want, you know, I don't want him, I don't want my yard. Get out, you know, I, I mean, this guy, everybody was afraid of him and knew him. And he just was like this for a long, long time. He, had a, it was, he was so bound that he just, he just didn't know how to respond when even Jesus met him. <laughs> I mean, the demons just started talking right away. Amen. But my point is, is that after the, the Bible says that after he was saved, I believe, and delivered, here's what the Bible says in Matthew 5, 19. Jesus said, go home and tell your friends. Tell them how the great, all the great things that the Lord has done for you. And the Bible says that he began to publish it all over his neighborhood, all over his city. How all the good things that Jesus did for him. And the Bible says everyone was amazed. I don't know if I really like this guy yet. He's still got crazy hair. But he's born again. Right? He's, there's something there. The woman at the well, the Bible says all the men of the city came out to meet Jesus because of what she said about Jesus. Amen. Simon the sorcerer, he was called the great one. They were all afraid of him. And he, he uh, manipulated the system there and he influenced so many people in that, that particular city. I mean, the Bible says that he was called the great one. Simon the sorcerer, but how many know the gospel got a hold of him? Amen. Jesus Christ got a hold of him and he became one of the team. Amen. Eventually. Amen. And then we see Rahab, the harlot in the Old Testament. She's one of the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And then, of course, probably one of the greatest stories of we see of a guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> Amen. How many know this guy knew a lot of people? This guy had big influence. And so we began to see there's key people that God begins to save in the city. And I love this. I've got to end this. But in Acts chapter 18, um, one of the things that, that God spoke to Paul in, in a night vision 
he said, listen, I want you to know something. I'm with you right now. And when you go get ready to preach tomorrow and you, you go stand on those steps and, and you go stand in front of that statue that everybody's wor- uh, worshiping in the city, uh, and, you know, and, and you go talk to in front of that, listen, I want you to know something. I'm going to be with you tomorrow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and then he said this, no, nobody's going to hurt you, so th- let's get that settled. I'm going to be with you. Nobody's going to hurt you. And he said this, he said, for I have much people in this city. How many know when you start preaching the gospel, you'll find out where the Christians are? Amen. People say, well, I don't, I don't preach because, you know, all these demon-possessed people would run after me and chase me down. No, you're going to start discovering who the Christians are. Amen. You're going to start teaming up with other believers. Amen. As you begin to preach the gospel. The fourth thing is, is that there's an evident stirring. There's a stirring in the city. When we began to preach and we began to teach and, and, and do the good works of the kingdom and, and all the things that Jesus did, how many know there's an evident stirring? The Bible says in Acts chapter 19 that they were furious and they were angry. They were full of wrath and the whole city was filled with confusion. I mean, the Bible says they all rushed into the theater at one time and they wanted to, to you know, beat them up and the disciples and, and they were just angry. How many know it kind of stirs some things up? When we begin to preach the gospel, it stirs some things up. There's some evident stirring. The Bible says that in, in the city, I mean, in one city, everybody was divided, like right down the middle. One, some people loved the apostles, the other ones hated them. They were, they were split right down the middle, amen. People didn't know whether they should go to church or, or whether they should close the doors of the church. They were split right down the middle, right? And so, uh, and one of the things they complained about, the biggest thing is they, they're troubling our city. They're troubling our city. I love that. And it was the religious leaders that said that. It was the people that really didn't want the Lord. They were saying, man, they trouble our city. How many know? Amen, people at River Valley and City Church and City Alliance and some of these other churches. Amen, come on, First Church. Amen, we're going to trouble the city a little bit. Amen. We're going to cause, we're going to stir some things up. Amen. We're not going to do it in, in the name of uh, fighting. Come on, we're not going to do it in the name of anger. We're not going to do it. We're going to do it in the name of righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah, because of the gospel. gospel the gospel has a way of stirring people up. Amen. And, and the, uh, the other thing is, is that the power of God is released. That's what happens when we begin to preach the gospel. The Bible says that when uh, Jesus promised us that if we preach the gospel with signs following, the Bible says he's worked, he'll work with us. And that's what it's, we, we find that in Mark chapter 16. They went forth and they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming with the word, with signs following. Amen? And the last thing I want to share today is that really when we began to preach the gospel, when we began to impact our city and we'll begin to see city-wide revivals, that we understand, as we've been talking about, that physical needs are met through good works. How many know this is important? Amen. This is so important. Amen. Well, I'm just going to stay home, and I'm going to pray, and I'm just going to sit on my blessed assurance, and I'm just going to, and then, and then God's going to just have this light shine around me, about me, and when I go to the store, people are going to fall down and get saved, and then, then I'm just going to have this great ministry. <laughs> How many know people won't get saved until you start, like, serving, until you start showing the love of Jesus, come on, until you kind of get out of your four walls and just begin to serve a little bit, amen. Jesus said, by your good works, they're going to glorify your Father which is in heaven, amen. Let me just leave you with this, that people will know that we're Christians by our love, the love that we have for one another. People will know that God is real when they see your good works, and people will be saved when they hear the gospel. Amen. And so when we love one another as Christians, as, as Christ loved us, and, and really kind of just allow the blood of Jesus, amen, to unify us like it already does, and come together and begin to say, you know what, we may not agree on a lot of things, but one thing we do agree on is the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen. And so when we do that and we begin to, amen, let people see our good works through Jesus, I believe, as the Bible says, that we can see the gospel of the kingdom go forth in our city. But how many know it's got to start in our city? It's got to start in our homes. It's got to start in our neighborhoods. It's got to start with us. You know, it, come on, it's got to start with us. You say, well, Brother Matt, you must be a great evangelist. No, I'm, I, I'm a pastor. That's, I mean, I, that's my thing. I, I'm an administrator. I, I, I love to help. But, you know, how many know we still got to do the work of an evangelist? We still got to do the work of an evangelist. And so there's a release of the spirit of the love of God and, and the generosity that comes from God when we begin to step out of our comfort zone and preach the gospel. Amen. How many want to say today, I want to impact my city? Amen. I want to see citywide revival today. I don't know if you're praying for that. You need to put that on your list. Amen. I want to see citywide revival. Amen. Every time you hear the news or read the paper, whatever you do, I want you to just take a moment and stop right there and just pray over our city. 
I want you to just think, Lord, I, 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 there's a lot going on right now, and I just, I'm so depressed over this and discouraged and frustrated about it, but I'm going to believe that the gospel is greater than any darkness that's in our culture, amen, right now. Any confusion that's in our culture, the, the gospel is greater. Come on, any division that's going on in our culture, the gospel is greater than that in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Can we stand on our feet today? I think it's important to, we ask ourselves, where can I start? Obviously, we just look around, as Jesus said, just go, as Jesus said. But I just want to encourage you, I say this a lot, but I want to encourage you, just start where you are. Just start where you are, right? Just use what you have. Just use what you have. And then do what you can. And I think a lot of people are so caught up in, I want this high place of ministry. I want to be this prophet, this apostle, so-and-so. And then people are going to get saved. No, Jesus didn't come as the apostle, king, whatever. He came as a servant. And he started where he was. He started in his hometown. He started right with what he had, right? He had the gospel. He had the kingdom on the inside of him. That's what the Bible says. Amen. He had, amen, his experience with the Lord. He has knowledge of God. He just had what, what he just started with what he had. And then, amen, he just did what he could. He went where he could. The Bible says that he was on a mission to seek and save that which was lost. The people that God had created that had fallen away through sin and been born in sin. The Bible says that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you believe that? But while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Amen. I'm so glad that I don't have to, you don't have to c come to church and get cleaned up and you've got to know all this Bible knowledge. You just got to know Jesus. Amen. Just understand that Jesus died for you. He died for the sins of the whole world that he took on, on himself on the cross. Your pain, your sickness, your sin, your diseases on himself in your place. Come on. So that you can have eternal life. So that you can live in this inheritance with the saints. So that you can have these blessings that God has blessed even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Come on. Amen. It's through Jesus Christ that we need to tell people that they can be, they're known of God, they, they're loved of God, and they need to walk in this relationship with the Lord. I'm so thankful for what God's given us today. Amen? Amen. And so I just want to encourage you, amen, to be mission-minded, to be praying about the harvest, and, and let this action of giving and going be in your life. Just this action of giving and going. And, and uh, you know, we used to give this little thing, and I want to give it real quick as we leave, but amen, just where you, where you can start is to pray, is just pray for open doors. Just pray for open doors. We, we know that. Amen. If you've been here more than five years, you know that. We've said that all the time. Pray for open doors. Amen. How many know we need boldness to go into those doors sometimes? God will open that door in the grocery store. Someone will say, who is Jesus? You're like, open door, right? Holy Spirit's like open door. And you're like, hey, I got an open door today. See you later, man. Good talking to you. But then we need that boldness to go in. We need that boldness to, Lord, I want to say not just a word. I want to see the right word. Lord, I want to say the word that, that, that really would bring healing. And that doesn't that mean you have to be, you know, have some prophetic insight and everything. Just what scripture that you have. What, what principle do you want me to share with them? What, what word do you want me to say to them, Lord? And so give me that boldness to say it. Give me that right word at the right time, the right word to say that to them that would just mean something to them today, that would point them to you, that would kind of like really bring attention on you and, and, and make you popular and make you famous and Anything that I can do to kind of like bring attention to, to you, Lord, just help me. And then we need wisdom. We need that wisdom, don't we? Amen. We need that wisdom, that soul-winning wisdom, Lord, of where to go. Where, I mean, I guess I can just give to the blue box. I guess I can just go and, 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 and feed people. I, just, I guess I can do that. But I do want to do those things, and I'm going to do those things. But how many know there's like people that are right around me, Lord, that, that are just suicidal and depressed and and they're anxious. They're so anxious that they want to end it all. They're so depressed they want to end it all. They're so, so lost that they're just taking and putting any chemical in their body they can get their hands on, Lord. They're right around me. Show me, Lord. Show me today. How many can have this heart today? Amen. That we want to see citywide revival. Can we do this? Can we just pray for our city today? Can we pray for our region, our area? Father, we... What's up, fam? This is Michael. Thank you for joining us. If you love what you saw, don't forget to hit that like button, the subscribe button, then the bell notification with all the notifications on so that you can be informed on every time we post new content. If the Lord's placed it on your heart to give, you'll find that link down in the description below. Don't forget to follow us on all of our other social media platforms so that you can be up to date on everything we're doing here at River Valley Church. Most of all, 
if you need someone to stand with you in prayer. Click the link to our website. You'll find contact information. We want to get you in contact with prayer warriors who are going to stand with you in your time of need. Thank you for joining us today. We love you. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next time. God bless.